We are live, everyone. So my name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. For those joining us for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And we are so excited today to continue our awesome series with the Toronto Zoo. Over 16 programs highlighting everything from tree kangaroos to Komodo dragons, tigers, and more. We are also just off our weekend virtual camp out with the Toronto Zoo. So if you check out the Toronto Zoo's YouTube page, over 35,000 families have now tuned in to see us do Ontario animals on Saturday and a tour through the African Savannah on Sunday. I really encourage you to check that out. Before we dive in with today's topic, which is super exciting, I wanted to make a few quick announcements. One, this weekend, Friday through Sunday, Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants is doing our first ever Global Biodiversity Festival in support of six amazing conservation organizations. So you can check that out at globalbiofest.com, and I will link that in the chat bar. Uh, and that's a place where you can donate, find out the schedule, tune in live, and, and learn about some of the coolest topics in the world. Secondly, I want to give a huge thanks to some of the kids who have been joining every single one of our zoo se sessions. So Andreas, Harriet, Genevieve, Juliet, uh, and so many more, Charlie in Ottawa. You guys have been amazing. It's so awesome having a, a you know, good group of students the entire time. Thank you so much. Before we dive in, we are using a Slido again today for today's zoo program, as always. So today's event code is SALMON. So SALMON, and we have some cool quizzes, polls, games, stuff like that. And you can share your questions there as well. All right, without further ado, the reason uh, or the topic that we're going to cover today is we are out in the field with the Toronto Zoo. We're not actually on the zoo site. We are out in the field with Mary Ellen and Kat, and they're going to highlight their salmon release program. So this is something that blows my mind. Kids get the chance to raise baby salmon in their classrooms and release them into the local streams, all in an effort to bring back Atlantic salmon to the Great Lakes. I'm so excited to hear about this topic today, and we are joined by a teacher as well. It's so nice to have Ms. Hoffs here with us, uh, who formerly worked at the zoo as well. All right, let's dive in. I'm going to turn it over to Mary Ellen and Kat, and take it away, ladies. All right. Hi, Jesse, and hi, everyone watching in today. This got a bit windy, so we're going to get a little close and zooming here. Uh, but I'm uh, here at Greenwood Conservation Area, which is located in Ajax. And it is the traditional territory of many different First Nations, including the Anishinaabe, Huron Wendat, Chippewa, Mississaugas of the, of the Credit, as well as the Haudenosaunee, if I didn't say that already. Uh, but we want to respect the, the land that we're here on today. And uh, it's really fitting uh, with our salmon. Uh, because salmon used to be a symbol or still are a symbol of abundance and fertility in many First Nations cultures. Uh, so we want to respect the land and respect the salmon that we're here to release uh, so that we can keep this land uh, really healthy for years to come. Uh, but on that note, we do have real live salmon today, uh, which is so exciting because a lot of the time when I'm giving presentations, I do not get to bring a live animal with me. Uh, so but today's a little different. So here are some of the salmon. Maybe we can see them up close. And they're about an inch long or so today. And we will get into the salmon life cycle so we can get an idea of what it took to get to this point and how much longer it's gonna take before they are adults. Uh, but to start their lives, salmon come as little eggs like most fish. These are fake salmon eggs. But if you've ever played with Orbeez, they look a lot like those orange or red Orbeez about the same size and the same, sh same shape. Well, lots of bugs out today. I don't know if you can see them, <laughs> but bugs are good for lots of fish and other animals to eat. Uh, so these are little fake salmon eggs. So this is about a pea size and they'll keep growing from there. Uh, then they turn into this guy who's an alvin. They're about one centimeter long and they have this big orange blob on them. Can you see that? Pretty strange. Um, and that's actually like a built-in fridge. Uh, we call that a yolk sack. And these guys are just little babies, so they can't go catch their own food. Uh, so they'll hide in the gravel, just like the guys in this photo, and they will absorb all of that food from their built-in fridge. Because even when we're babies, even when we're kids, right, we can't make our own food. Uh, so this is really helpful for them uh, to get their own food and not be eaten by somebody else when they're out catching their own food. Uh, because unlike a lot of other animals out there, fish parents, they have their babies and they say, see you never. So maybe you've seen Finding Nemo, maybe you got an idea that fish dads really care about their fish babies. In real life, not so much. Then from our Alvin, right, we saw these guys. <laughs> these are our fry. Uh, so you'll see that they no longer have that yolk sac. They no longer have a built-in fridge. Uh, so they are ready to start catching their own food. Uh, when they're at the zoo, 
we do feed them around this stage once they no longer have their built-in fridge. Uh, so you can see that they're swimming around looking for their breakfast. But usually on the day that we release them, we don't feed them breakfast so that they're ready to go and catch their own food and not really relying on us anymore. Uh, they're ready to go nibble on some stuff out in the river. From there, they grow into this guy here who's like a, um, the smolt stage, about six or eight inches long at this point. And this is uh, kind of like the teenager of the salmon world. And this is when they do their migration, their big long journey. They're swimming out to Ocean University, Ocean College, Ocean Apprenticeship, whatever their path is, they're swimming all the way out uh, to this bigger body of water. And that's where they get lots and lots of food. Out in the ocean, it's like an all you can eat buffet. So they're eating all this food and they're growing really big, really fast. And in about three years, they're getting to be full-sized Atlantic salmon like this guy here. This is probably around a seven or eight year old size salmon. Uh, and once they do that, they will come swim back to the river where they were born. Uh, and then they will start breeding and starting their family so that they can have new baby salmon. Uh, there are some salmon that will actually change color. <laughs> uh, so we you know uh, over on the Pacific uh, Ocean, there's lots of salmon that will get bright, bright red. When they're ready to start their family, they'll get a bit of a bump and hook on their snout. And that just says, hey, I'm ready to find my husband slash wife. I'm ready to have some babies. Uh, and then uh, that's how we know uh, they go through that color change. But Atlantic salmon are pretty different. They're really special uh, because they don't actually go all the way out to the ocean. They stay right here in the Great Lakes. So they'll start their life in this little river, stay here for a couple of years until they're a few inches long. They'll swim all the way down into Lake Ontario or another Great Lake. That's when they'll grow. That's their all-you-can-eat buffet. And then they return back here after a couple of years. Uh, so their life cycle is probably around seven or eight years, maybe a little bit longer as well. And a cool, another cool thing about salmon is that they will have uh, multiple babies over multiple years. So some salmon, like our Pacific salmon, they can only spawn once. They only have their babies once. So much energy to do that migration all the way from the rivers to the oceans and back that they die. Uh, but they're able to have those babies first. With our Atlantic salmon, they go just uh, down, just down, <laughs> just down the river uh, into the Great Lakes, not too far at all. Uh, and then they get nice and big and they come back here. So because it's a shorter distance, they're able to save up more energy to come back and do this year after year. Uh, at the Toronto Zoo, which is why we're here today, is we have this program where we're bringing back the salmon. And we're part of a larger program with the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters, as well as the Ontario government, to restock this, the Atlantic salmon into Lake Ontario so that we have a self-sustaining population. So self-sustaining means that we're going to try and get as many of them out in here so that we never have to do it again. So the goal is probably by 2025, so another couple of five, five years or so, to have them fully self-sustaining. The large program has been going on for about 20 years. And at the zoo, we've been doing this for about 11 years. So uh, we know that there's definitely adult salmon that are coming back and having their babies here. So we just wanna make sure that they keep going on the up and up. And uh, let's see, when we do this program at the zoo, uh, we get them, the salmon, as little eggs. And like we saw, they're about a pea size. And we actually raise the, them in classrooms as well as at the Toronto Zoo. So when we set up the hatchery in the classroom, we put them in this guy here, who's called an incubation tray. And basically it's like little one bedroom condos and each little egg gets their own one bedroom condo to stay nice and safe. And if they have any diseases or any fungus, it doesn't spread to the others. So it's really safe for them to be in here. And these are not real eggs. These are just pom-poms today. Uh, but you get the idea that each one of our 100 eggs that go in the classroom get their own little box. And then once they are starting to hatch, usually uh, about a, a few months in, maybe around February, late February, uh, and they get them in January, uh, they will start to hatch and we'll open this up and the fish will swim out and they'll get to go hide in the gravel, which is their favorite thing to do at this point. A lot of the time you're like, oh, they're so boring, but they're just being safe, right? They want to hide in that gravel or they're going to try and avoid being eaten by somebody else. They don't really know that they're in a, a classroom hatchery, so they don't know there's no predators, uh, but it's still just their natural behavior where they're hiding in the gravel. And then, like I said, once they start growing and they're absorbing all of that yolk sac and that built-in refrigerator, 
that's when they start looking for food. So that's when we see them swimming up to the top of the tank and they're looking around and they're trying to find food. Uh, and that's when they're active enough that we say they're probably ready to go. So again, we'll see them in here. Some of them, not so much on the bottom, not a whole lot of water, but <laughs> they're swimming towards the top. And that's just where they would know that food would be. Uh, so now we're gonna see a real live release. I'll show you how I transport them here to our conservation site today. Uh, we've got a really cool custom made, uh, <laughs> uh, this guy here and we open it up and we've brought 250 salmon with us today. Uh, they go in the fish and swimming around, a little bit of their gravel came with them. So, so there's about 100 in this bag alone and I brought about three here today. And these guys would have been born probably in around uh, November, December, so about six months old. Ready? Earlier, I already prepped this just like the cooking shows. We've got some already in the bucket. And they are already in the bucket, and we will start releasing them. I have my net here, and we will bring it a little closer to the water. We are being safe around water. Uh, as one is, and I see that a shot of them in the net. See how ready they are to come over for me, and we'll pop them in here, and we'll watch them swim away. Hmm. Sometimes they're a little confused. Perfect. And off they. Oh. Very cool first release, guys. Just so you know, the connection's gotten a little iffier, so I'm just keeping you guys posted about that. All right. Let's see. We'll keep releasing them. Keep releasing. See if we can get any really good shots. Nice. Well, some of them are a little bigger than uh, the one inch. And you can see, maybe, I don't know how well you can see them in there because they are super camouflaged. Again, these guys are still babies. They're only about six months old. So they still need to make sure that they can hide from any predators that might be here to eat them. Could be things like other fish. Maybe some turtles might eat these guys. Maybe a bird. So they've got a lot of different animals that might be after them. So again, we'll scoop them up. Check them out. Splish splashing in there. And then out into the world. Last year, we released about 3,500 Atlantic salmon into Duffins Creek and Credit River. And this year, we're looking at closer to 2,000 salmon to be released. Look at him go. Nice. <laughs> Might do a few more scoops and then we can start taking some questions. Uh, but also, I just like to let you know that we will be doing another release, um, this time on Facebook Live at 1 p.m. on May 28th. So you can check that out too if you want to see this all over again. Okay, and we'll probably just lightly dump the rest of them and we can watch them swim away. Did I miss any? Oh, I did. No problem. There we go. So that is how our salmon releases work at the Toronto Zoo. Usually we do have our classes who are raising the salmon come with us, but with our current circumstances, we can all do this from the comfort of our own home as well. Uh, so I'm ready to take questions now, Jesse, if you've got any lined up. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Kat and Mariella, for an awesome salmon release today. Again, something that I never knew happened in, in with the Toronto Zoo or in Ontario streams. That's really, really cool. We're going to start with some live questions. So I'm going to go to Ms. Hoffs uh, at Winchester Public School in Whitby. Uh, so if you want to kick us off with some questions from your class, go for it. 
Okay, thank you so much, Kat and Mary Ellen, for releasing these live. My class is really excited. They've been asking me every day how the salmon are doing. So thank you for doing that. Um, one of the questions I got from my students was, where will the salmon end up exactly? And how long will it take them to swim there? Mm -hmm. uh, so the salmon that we released today, they'll stay in Duffins Creek for the first few years. Then they'll swim down into Lake Ontario, where it's much bigger, much more uh, food to eat in there, like that all-you-can-eat buffet. Uh, they'll stay there for a few more years and then they'll swim back up right here to where we release them um, because salmon have like a built-in compass. So they're going to return to where they were born uh, to, to lay their own eggs and start their families. Super cool. All right, so what we're going to do is alternate between the, the four questions of Ms. Hall's class and then some uh, YouTube and Slido ones. So our number one uh, question on Slido is from Andreas, as usual. Uh, where do, why do salmon swim upstream to give birth? Mm -hmm. uh, so they, salmon like very particular conditions to, in order to lay their eggs. So the female salmon, the girl salmon, they'll actually roll around in the gravel and that'll just get her all ready to lay her eggs. So they do want that shallower gravelly area, uh, which they can't really find in Lake Ontario or the ocean. Uh, so that's why they'll swim back up here to where they were born, uh, to, just to have those right conditions. Now, I heard you guys were going to do a demonstration personally of rolling around in the gravel, or was I mistaken about that? Uh, no. Well, uh, I mean, there's pretty high water levels, so I'd be worried about my safety today. I think that's I, true. I should roll, roll right in. All right. All, all programs out in the field must be safe. And with that, I'll uh, tail between my legs. I'll go back to Ms. Haas for a second question. <laughs> go for it. And Oh, you should be unmuted. There we go. Perfect. There we go. Um, all right. One of my students, I don't know if you know the answer to this, uh, but one of my students wanted to know how many salmon hatched from the eggs in our class. I know you probably just have the total, um, but do you usually do all the salmon that hatch survive or do you have some casualties in, in the process? That's a great question. Uh, so in the wild, we're looking at only about 10% of salmon babies surviving the first six months. Uh, so about 90% of them are dying. That's due to things like big predators. Uh, they're running into maybe some issues with the weather. Maybe it's too cold. Maybe it's too warm. Uh, you know, we never know <laughs> up here in Canada with our snow when it's going to come, right? It was like two weeks ago, we still had snow. Uh, so some, things like that can really impact uh, whether they survive that first six months. Uh, but in the classroom program, we're looking at over 90% surviving the first six months. So the total opposite. And again, that's because they're in, they're in a, a classroom hatchery. Uh, where we're controlling those conditions. We're keeping it nice and cold. Salmon really like it to be about five degrees Celsius, which is like far too cold for me to want to go anywhere near the water. Even just keeping my hand in there to, <laughs> to scoop them out, it's very cold. Uh, and they also like it to be dark. So we keep uh, the hatchery covered with insulation so that it stays nice and dark in there. And we're taking away all of those things that might hurt them in that first six months. So by keeping them safe, we know that the first six months, we're seeing about 90% of them survive. So I would say, Miss Haas, for your class, probably about at least 90 survived, if not the full 100, uh, to make it out here today. Super cool. Thanks so much, Kat. All right, Sitara Maimuna, who again have been joining us for every one of our zoo sessions, so a huge hi to you guys. Their first question is, are there still invasive species in the Great Lakes that would affect the numbers of salmon there? Mm, that's a great question. Uh, so there are definitely invasive species here in the Great Lakes. Some of those big ones are our zebra mussels, uh, which are just covering all sorts of things all over the place. Our docks, marinas, boats, they love them. Uh, they might not have too bad of an impact um, in terms of our salmon, uh, at least not a direct impact. Uh, the zebra mussels are very good at keeping water clean, uh, just like our freshwater mussels, which we'd rather have many more of our freshwater native mussels than we would the zebra mussels, uh, but they are helping the water quality. Um, in terms of other invasive species that might be impacting them, at least in, um, in some farm fish scenarios, there are things called water fleas that are impacting the salmon, uh, but we're not really seeing that out here in our wild uh, release salmon. We've also got lots of invasive plant species around the Great Lakes that might be affecting water temperature by increasing the amount of coverage over top of the water. Uh, so things like Phragmites, we've got, I don't know, Mary Ellen, you want to just, just pan over there. We do have some sorts of reeds. I don't know if that's exactly Phragmites, but it looks a lot like it. Uh, so things like that might be impacting the different uh, other animals that are living in these ecosystems. And uh, we have many different kinds of invasive species. I could probably go on for a while, uh, but in general, I don't think that's uh, the main impact that's affecting the salmon. 
Okay, thanks, Kat. This has been great. Uh, Ms. Hoffs, if you have a third question from your class, come on up. Just demute your mic. I do. So a few of our questions have been answered already. So that was amazing. Um, the last one that we have is, what did you guys feed the salmon when they were ready to eat at the zoo just before release? I know you didn't feed them today, but you mentioned uh, in a few days ago that you guys have been feeding them because we didn't feed them in the classroom. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, so just like you might feed a pet uh, or a pet fish in your own aquarium at home, uh, we're feeding them pellets, uh, which are just kind of ground up fish food that fish like to eat. Uh, so they're made specifically for salmon and trout. Uh, so they have all the nutrients that those sorts of fish would need. Awesome. Thanks so much. Great questions, everybody. And we're having great questions pouring on YouTube and Slido as well. So uh, we're whipping through these. This is awesome, guys. All right. Athena in Waterdown wants to know, how many salmon have you released over time since you started this program? Uh, so from the Toronto Zoo, we've probably released about, um, well, last year I said we released about 3,500. So probably about that many over the past 10 years. Oh, I heard a fish behind me. Uh, but we're looking at maybe around 30,000 fish um, that we've released personally. Uh, but part of the larger program is releasing probably closer to 100,000 fish every year. Uh, so we're a small fraction of that bigger program. Uh, but together we're all working to restore those Atlantic salmon in the Great Lakes. Outstanding. How great is that, guys? All right. Uh, Alice in Salem, Massachusetts wants to know, how many times a year do you release salmon? Is it just the once, like over the next couple of weeks or any other times? Yep. So we just stick with the once a year. The salmon that we get, they are always born in November and December. So just by May and June, that's when they're ready to be released. So we just do it the once a year. We work it in with the school year so that students get them basically as soon as they come back from uh, their winter break and they keep them just until uh, May and June. And sometimes it can be like a fun end of the year field trip where we get to go outside, spend some time in nature, release the fish uh, that the students have worked so hard to care for and get really familiar with this endangered species and uh, help bring them back into nature. Awesome, thank you, Kat. All right, uh, between Slido and YouTube, we're having a whole bunch of questions along the same theme, which is, does pollution affect salmon in any way? Uh, so that, that is probably one thing that does affect salmon as well as many other different species in the Great Lakes. Uh, I was on last week talking all about litter in the Great Lakes. So if you missed that one, uh, that might give you some insight into how the litter is affecting different animals and wildlife in, uh, in our Great Lakes. Uh, but another thing that is affecting the salmon or did affect them is uh, overfishing. So what happened was we had lots and lots of salmon about 200 years ago in the Great Lakes, uh, but our first settlers came over and overfished them like crazy. They saw all of these wonderful salmon and they just scooped them up really fast. Um, and that in addition to industrialization, so our, again our settlers are coming, they're building all of this cool stuff that they want to live in, railroads, houses, um, and that ended up affecting uh, the pollution in the water and how many people were near all of the water uh, and it ended up bringing those salmon down to about zero uh, in the Great Lakes, so almost down to nothing. Uh, so we do say that salmon are locally extinct, they're extirpated here in the Great Lakes, uh, so we are working to get them away from that really bad endangered status that's like next to extinct uh, and we're trying to bring them back up. Nice. And that uh, was a beautiful answer of, of a question we've gotten on YouTube from a few students too, of, of why this is a problem. Why do we need to release them at all? So that was, you killed two birds with one stone. Way to go. <laughs> uh, all right. Ireland and Collingwood and a huge uh, hi to you too. Again, the students that have been coming for our zoo sessions are more loyal than any other program we have. They seem to come to every single one, which is awesome. Um, so Ireland wants to know, what predators do salmon have? Salmon are carnivores and they're usually a top predator, so they don't really have that many other fish that are looking to eat them. There are things like pike that would be eating them, as well as a lot of our large birds of prey might swoop down. Not so much around here, they might be faced by bears, uh, but luckily that's a pretty rare occurrence uh, in the greater Toronto area. <laughs> Awesome. Um, we got a great question from Sitar and Maimuna again on Slido, and that is, if I'm going to the grocery store and I'm going to buy salmon, is there a type of salmon I should buy, whether it's a species or anything I should look for to make sure that I'm getting sustainably fished salmon? Yeah, and that, <laughs> that's a great question, and it's a complicated question. Uh, I'm going to recommend that you check out the Seafood Watch Guide, uh, which is put out by the Monterey Bay Aquarium, I believe, and it has a website as well as an app. 
and you can check that out to get an idea of how to make better choices at the grocery store uh, when looking for sustainably harvested fish. Uh, but I know on their guide, something they recommend is salmon from New Zealand, uh, which you don't then have to balance with the carbon footprint of importing fish from that far. So it will be uh, some research for you to do and make your own personal decisions about what is most valuable to you when you're eating or buying fish. But there's definitely lots of resources out there. So you can just easily go check that guide as well as do some other Googling and see what comes up and what's important to you. Fantastic. Seafood Watch is a great program recommended by basically every one of the fish conservation biologists we bring in on this program. Another one to look for is Ocean Wise. So the Vancouver Aquarium, they have a little Ocean Wise simple cool fish. You'll see this on fish products at restaurants and grocery stores and you can check that out and again that means that it's been fished in a sustainable way um, and you're doing pretty much as well as you can be. Um, fantastic. Let's see if there's any other really big questions. Uh, how big is your biggest salmon? So this could be uh, the biggest ones you release or it could be how big do these salmon get in general which you sort of showed us earlier what i got here is a special piece of string um so this here is going to show us just how long our atlantic salmon can get so let's see that's our spotted gar here's our atlantic salmon so this is about how big a full-size atlantic salmon will get but to give you an idea of the largest fish that you could find right here in the great lakes this is like <laughs> Mary Ellen might hold this hand <laughs> and we'll see how far away I can get. This is definitely social distancing friendly. So this is our lake sturgeon. And this guy here is found in the Great Lakes, also an endangered species here. And I think this guy is three meters long. They can get up to and about 300 pounds. So it's like double my, like double me. So they're almost like a shark. Uh, but they are not here to hurt us for sure in the Great Lakes. <laughs> but it just gives you an idea of salmon. They are uh, pretty large for an Atlantic salmon in the Great Lakes. The Pacific salmon do get much larger. Uh, so over on the West Coast, you're looking at, you know, quite a bit bigger than our friend right here. Uh, but they are a very large fish. Fantastic. You are wowing kids on YouTube. <laughs> well, what else do I have in my pockets? <laughs> Um, well, uh, ladies, we're getting near the end of our program. So what I want to ask now is for the students that are asking on YouTube, Slido, and more, how can a classroom in Toronto, the GTA, get involved with this program and raise salmon? What do they have to do? Uh, so one, uh, <laughs> the number one way is to go check out our website. Um, it's torontozoo.ca slash Great Lakes, I believe. And that has all of our information about the Aqualinks program that we have here at the zoo. Uh, but we are also partnered, like I said, with the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters. And with their program, their range is a little bit bigger. It's outside of the GTA, uh, and they are they can take a little bit higher capacity than we can here at the zoo. Uh, but those are, um, I think there's the Lake Ontario Atlantic Salmon Restoration Program, L-O-A-S-R-P dot com or dot C-A. You'll have to check that out. Um, I think the, the link should be with our zoo to you page as well um, so you can check out that website and get an idea and our email specifically for this program is aqualinks at torontozoo.ca awesome all right i'm going to link that in the chat bar for everyone to check out i have passed along the website um and i encourage you guys to all check that out there's there's i Again, would have been my dream as a kid to be able to release some salmon into a, a stream locally here in the GTA. Um, so I, I hope you guys are as enthused as I am. And uh, before we wrap up, I don't know, are there any other last messages? You mentioned it's May 28th, another release uh, on Facebook Live. So that's fantastic. Um, any other programs we should look forward to over the next coming weeks? I think we'll be back again on Thursday with a zoo program all about turtles because we do have World Turtle Day um, information coming. Uh, so that's going to be really cool. Uh, and then uh, still more to come in all of the upcoming weeks. Outstanding. So yes, for Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants program, it is every Tuesday and Thursday at 11 a.m. Eastern. Uh, we look forward to having you back. And you can check out our whole archive of our programs on YouTube. A few last notes that I said at the beginning I want to repeat now. You can also check out the Toronto Zoo's virtual campout program just from this last weekend on their YouTube channel. Uh, I had the, the honor of hosting that, and it was such a great time. So whether you want to explore Ontario animals or the African savanna, do check that out. And then here at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants this coming weekend, our Global Biodiversity Festival, all in support of six amazing conservation organizations. Check that out. Go check out the amazing zoo site. Find out how you can uh, learn more about and release some salmon. And the Toronto Zoo to You site with more of their digital education programs is also linked in the comments section. All right, without further ado, we'll wrap it up from there. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, Ms. Host, uh, for the team at the Toronto Zoo. 
and uh, we'll say bye to you guys and have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye, Zuji. Right. Thanks, Jesse.